All right, here we have situations here. We don't want to try to set ourselves in judgment over anybody, but occasionally we have to uh, drop the ball. Somebody drops the ball, we got to pick it up, basically. What we got here, and back in the days, whenever uh, this truck was brand new at the time, is whenever cell phones were installed in the vehicle. Remember those days? Yes. Cell phones were installed in the vehicle. They actually would, you know, run some screws in there, and they'd run some wires, and they'd put stuff in a fuse box and all this kind of stuff, and they would mount the thing in the floor. The Blue Crown Victoria that we've got has still got one of those stupid old analog cell phones, and <laughs> in the floorboard has been there ever since 1998. <laughs> this job right here happened in uh, about the turn of the century. All right. Whenever uh, it came in on the hook, right? It comes in on the hook. And you know, by opening uh, things here, and I got, you know, I got to make sure I got my notes here. Park a brand new car in the woods, leave it there for five years. Are you going to go back and start that car up and drive away on it? No. Why? The gas goes rotten, the tires goes flat, the battery goes dead. Except on that commercial that you see about the batteries, where there's an old car sitting there with weeds growing up all around it, it's playing old music on the radio, and you go over there and, the, and you're thinking, ooh, this looks spooky, and they say the battery is supposed to be a interstate or something and has lasted all these years, you know, but yeah. anyway, uh, uh, it's, that's an example of the second law of thermodynamics, which basically says that, nothing, you know, things don't get better by themselves. If things left to themselves always get worse, right? That's the second law of thermodynamics. The first law is you've got to trade matter for energy. You've got to burn wood to get heat. You've got to burn gas to get heat. you got to change one for, and you always lose something in the process. The second law basically is a law of, is a law of increasing entropy. Anything you make, if you leave it out in the woods, it's going to go in pot. That's what that is. Okay, but people try to improve their cars. If somebody takes a really nice car, like like you say, you got a, a vintage Camaro, right? You got two of them. You got one sitting side by side. Uh, Both of them have been driven regularly. Let's go. One of them has had the oil change in the transmission service and new tires put on it, brakes all that time. Nobody really changed anything on it, they just left it alone. They left everything pretty much like it was, they always put the same kind of tires on it. Then you got another one that's dolled up and it's got a fancy radio on the dash and it's got different size wheels and tires on it and all this other kind of stuff. Both of them are sitting side by side, same number of miles on them. Which one would you buy? Would you buy the one that was, had not been touched, it was in vintage condition, or would you buy the one that had the racing straps and the mag wheels and the peace sign and the four on the floor. I'd buy the one that hadn't been touched. Because even if it's going to be modded, I want to be able to choose the mods. I don't want to do somebody else's mods. And so we used to see a lot of these people put these little bitty tires on there that make the car just ride, you know, bouncing on the ground and look like crap and all this kind of stuff. It doesn't make the car ride better. It doesn't make it worth more. It doesn't make it worth sell for more money when you sell it. You know, it basically just makes it, it suits it to the person's fancy. Well, they'll cut the catalytic converters off and they'll put some loud, ugly mufflers on, you know. Which, uh, but anyway, here this thing. This 2000 Ranger came in. The modifications were meant to be minor. They put a cell phone in there. Not a big deal, right? Putting a cell phone in there is a good thing if you want to be able to call somebody. But after the cell phone installed and got through with it, they had to push it out of the shop. Push it out of the shop. Wrecker brings it to the forward place. My helper, Ryan, found a blown fuel pump fuse. First thing we notice, switch on the key. We don't hear a pump. We go figuring out why. Fuel pump fuse is blown. Sounds really easy. So we put another fuel pump fuse in there. Pop. As soon as you turn on the key, it pops. Okay, what do we know? What happens when you turn on the key? Too much amperage. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that's, it isn't uh, a straight, direct answer. What I was looking for is, each power relay fires up the coil on the fuel pump relay. Fuel pump relay energizes, and it sends power to the fuel pump. And it sends power through the inertia switch and some connectors and all that kind of stuff down to the pump. Pops, pops the fuse. All right. So... What we got right here, we're going to get a layout of the power distribution center. It shows the location of the bulb fuse and the fuel pump relay. There's the fuel pump fuse. There's the fuel pump relay. Now, it's just like our Ranger we got out here. It's in the same place. Fuel pump relay, fuel pump fuse. All right, so that's what we're basically looking at right here. Make sure I don't leave anything out. So we, I had Ryan, he had him fill the relays. You know, while we switch a key on and all that kind of stuff. So that's what we... You feel the relays, you can get an idea of which one it is. You know, click, you know, and he was feeling the relays and he was moving them around to see, you know, trying to figure out which one will switch. And we pulled up the schematic and that's when we had to do this because this feeling of the relays, we couldn't tell anything uh, because of the fact that obviously it was blown. So a quick study showed that the blown fuse had been feeding the secondary side 
of the fuel pump relay, which explains why it popped when the key was switched on. The secondary side of the fuel pump relay is which side? You got you got fuel, you got relay, you got primary and secondary side. What's the difference between a primary and a secondary side of anything? The primary side sends a signal, the secondary side is where the work's done. The primary side of your coil is the little wire that goes over here that triggers the coil to fire, the secondary side is where the spark's made. The primary side of the relay operates the coil, the secondary side is what pulls the load. The secondary side of the relay, which it actually sends the power out of the pump, is the one that is the fuse that was blowing. Okay, so I very gently, I very gently took my little test light here, and that one is one that I have that's got a little LED in it because I knew I'm basically looking for any kind of ground right here whatsoever. I ease that in there. That turns green whenever it's got a ground. It turns red. I just put a little two color LED in there. I got from Radio Jack, you know. And uh, I don't even remember. I like I got this uh, for nearly no money off the tool truck because nobody wanted it. And I used it for certain jobs. But that's it. I still got it at home, by the way. But anyway, I eased it into that relay in the, wire, in the one that goes to the fuel pump. Now, if I've got a fuel pump that is not working and it's not a blown fuse issue, then I'm actually going to take that test line, I'm going to get it hot, and I'm going to put it in the same place, and if I see a ground there, that means I've got a good connection all the way through to the fuel pump. Okay, but when I disconnect the fuel pump, what should this ground do? It should go away. I disconnected the fuel pump on this one, and the ground went nowhere. It stayed there. That's telling me that that wire going to the fuel pump is a dead short now, somewhere. Okay, so now we've got to figure out where. We don't want to, some people were just taking, clip wires and run another wire and if you wind up having to do that it's always a good idea to make sure you run it as factory as you can make sure it feeds everything else that wire fed and put it in some convolute tubing and tie wrap it up out of the way so it doesn't get wrapped around the drive shaft or something. Uh, one way or another I wrap the inertia switch with the heel of my pocket now. Whack! That's what the inertia switch does when you whack it with the heel of your pocket now. The inertia switch is there so that if you have an accident, it cuts off the fuel pump. So you're not have, you haven't cut fuel lines and you're pumping fuel all over the place, you're going to set the road on fire. You don't want to go there. So you, uh, Ford and Toyota and some Nissans have an inertia switch. No General Motors car has an inertia switch. Uh, you know, not a, and Chryslers don't have inertia switches, but a Ford and some of them, wham, they want to turn the fuel pump off when you have an accident so you don't have the fuel pump and fuel everywhere. All right. But even if the circuit goes short, the load will burn the lights. And that's what I was talking about right here on these little notes. All right, let me go to the next one. All right, see right here? Your pump relay is right here. This is the secondary side of the relay. This is the primary side of the relay. The engine controller, see the e power relay powers up the coil. The, e, the, e, the PCM uses it for two seconds when you switch on the key, it energizes that. And that throws this over, except on your truck, it goes for 20 seconds because it's one of those six liter power stroke diesel, so it's the only one that does that. This one right here, two seconds, and just about every vehicle look at. You notice this right here, the PCM is looking at that. It's actually watching that. It wants to see a ground there, and when it energizes that relay, if I energize this, that ground should go away, and I'll see power there. So it basically, the PCM is monitoring that circuit. That's all this is for. Now that right there is not going to do anything, you know, to anything. It's just a monitor circuit. It doesn't do anything other than watch. Here's your inertia switch. Another there on the right side of the dash on that particular one. Whack. All right, you got to be able to find where it is. This goes to the instrument cluster. You might have seen some of them have, it says fuel cut out. I got a light that says fuel cut out on the instrument cluster. That's what that does. This particular one will actually ground a circuit. Click like that right there, and it'll send a signal over there and tell a light to come. I say that it might be looking, I'm trying to figure out there. When that comes on, I don't know how the rest of that's wired, but that's not where we're going. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to go into that and make myself look like a fool. Inertia switches here. All right. All right. So, found the place. Let me go here. The harness that leaves the inertia switch, and let me back up a second. See this right here? 309. This was the first thing I checked. Where that red square is, that's the second thing I checked. C309. Okay, we went and found out where C309 is. Here's C309 right here. Go to the location matrix. 309 is going through the floorboard on that truck. Our Ranger does not have this. This was 2000 model. Ours is a 98. It wasn't made this way. This one here goes through. Huh? It goes down there through the. Come on here, buddy. It goes down through the floorboard and back to the gas tank. All right, that's what the connector looks like. If you want to make sure you got the right connector, you go to the connector shell, and you're going to look at the connector and make sure the one you unplugged is the right one because it will look like this. 
you'll have that many pins and all that kind of thing. Okay, there's your parts. You can uh, fondle those where you're turning into a skeleton over there. All right, let's see here. And what's in there? Now? I'll take that one. Okay. And uh, if that's how much it is, give me about you know six of those. Okay. And uh, Pontiac. Of course, they don't make any more. All right. You know what to do that there for. You know what right All right, so here we go. I unplug this. Well, this right here is what they look like on the truck. See this connector underneath the bottom? I unplug that. And what happened then? The short stayed. The short was still there. My light never went off. Back tracing it. I unplugged the inertia switch. Right there. When I unplugged this, it went off. When I unplugged that, well, I unplugged that first. It stayed on. I unplugged this, it went off. So that's between those two points. All right. <clears throat> that means the wire harness, as I trace it, goes under the carpet. See the screws? That's where they mounted the cell phone, or the cell phones. They went through the wires, ran it out. They sure did. This is what it looked like. They ran this hole through the harness with their, <laughs> with their screw. Wow. It went through, and it managed to, one of the little sharp edges of that screw thread managed to slice its way through that wire. This wire feeds a fuel pump. It could have been any of those wires. See what I'm saying? It could have caused the gas gauge to read screwy. What happens if you short the gas gauge, the yellow wire with a white strap? What happens if you short that in the ground on a gas gauge? It's all the way full. Now when you unplug it, it goes past full. When you short it, it goes all the way to empty. You'll be reading no gas. In this particular place, it popped the fuel pump fuse because it shorted that ground, carried it right into the body. I got a picture on my technical router page that I put in there where somebody ran a screw in through the back of the trunk right into the gas tank. Oh, oh my <laughs> you'll look up there, I you'll see that. it. Yeah, those are cool. Somebody said, well, I got plenty of room here. And then we pull the gas tank off. You know, I had to jerk it off of there because the threads were into the gas tank. One of those screws that looked like a drill on the end, you know? Mm -hmm. All right, so anyway, they did that. Well, and you notice the, you know, the title up here, you know, screwed. That's what happened up there. All right, the fob's inoperative now. Ah, now we've got an inoperative powered normally door locks. What's up with this? I mean, we thought we were through when we fixed the fuel pump part of it. Got it? All right, so they had originally printed the repair order with a no star complaint and added a handwritten addendum that the door locks were inoperative. So I tried the power locks. They wouldn't operate with the key fobs or with the door panel buttons. So we weren't done. All right. So the door lock actuators and the doors, they've got relays in a panel above the driver's right foot. A common terminal on each relay feeds both wires. You've wired them up this way. That's the center circuit that you're wired up on this board over here with the spinning light. The same thing. Got me? Got a relay box here. This is the wrap module. So I'll pause here for just a second. One time, in this same period of time, we got an expedition that came in there. The Ford was all around having to buy back because it had been at some dealership in Florida about four or five times. And any time they drove it in the rain, it would start honking the horn and flashing lights and stuff. <laughs> and it was, and they were, and the, the guy, the, the field service engineer from Ford went down there and he said, well, let's just replace all of the door ajar switches because maybe it's a perimeter anti-theft problem. Well, they replaced all the door ajar switches and then they, the, the last ditch effort about buying it back, they brought it up here and they said, and think about this, the pressure's on you. This is a really expensive vehicle. You gotta find out what's wrong with this thing or Ford's gonna have to buy it back. You know, they really don't want to buy it back, so they're bringing it here and they're throwing it on you. You know, and you need to find it reasonably quick, you know, without spending a lot of warranty money because the fuel service engineer has already blown a lot of dough. So anyway, and, and see, the thing about it is you didn't know if it was fixed or not until they drove it in the rain again and it started lighting off again. Say, and that's extremely annoying. Huh? You couldn't just put a water hose on it to dollars? We did that. They ran it through the car wash and it didn't do a darn thing. It had to be raining. Hmm. I don't know what they're doing. And that's just weird. But what I did was, I said, well, I know that the, the, the relay that feeds the horn, that it comes to the horn here, makes the horn relay operate, is a blue wire. I mean, I haven't known that. And uh, it was one of those things where I really, really got lucky. But I first looked and I said, wait a minute, these don't even have perimeter anti-theft on them. So it can't be a perimeter, perimeter, perimeter anti-theft problem. But the wrap module can blow the horn when you cycle a fob. 
you know. But anyway, I pulled the, looking down there by the master cylinder, I saw the blue wire that feeds the horn relay, and it was scratching against the corner of a bracket, and I could see copper. And I could actually touch it, it would honk the horn. Well, if you start bouncing the contacts on that relay, it's going to make a lot of little voltage spikes, and it's going to go back into the wrap module, and the wrap module's going to go, that, 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 and it's going to start flashing lights and all kind of crazy stuff. So I pulled that back, tied it off, taped it up, and I was a hero. Wow. <laughs> they didn't have to buy it back. It was one tiny little, but everybody else had missed it. And I don't know if it was just the Lord looking after me or whatever. All right, so right here we got uh, RKE schematic. Here's your route module, remote anti-theft personality. Now remember on a GM car, that's retained accessory power. It's not remote anti-theft personality. Park lamps output and all that. Here's your relay box. All right, so we're looking at that. All right, that's, a, that's an old uh, DC motor control that I've been showing you guys on this board over here. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Okay, okay, I got to take my little test light. So I switched the key on and found a good 12 volts at pin 12 and 20 of the RKE module. I want to make sure, see I got volts right here, see these pins right here? I got to make sure we got power going here. Now you can check those fuses and that's okay, but I'm wanting to know at the box. If I've got a box that's not working, I'm going to check power and ground in that box. If power and ground are going to the box and it's got the inputs it needs, it's going to work. If I've got power and ground in the box and it's got the inputs it needs and it don't work, you either need to reboot the darn thing, which is what I was telling you about the Dodge the other day, or you have to replace the box or whatever. This particular one, about that, terminals 12 and 20, feed the module. All right, they had power. They flipped to it. I flipped to a different schematic because I found power there. All right, here we go. Okay, there's your lock relay. Lock, all unlock, all lock, all unlock. Driver lock. Why is the driver lock got a different relay from the all lock, all unlock? That way when you hit up, unlock it once, it only unlocks. Only unlocks the driver's door, but when you lock it, it locks them all. And it's not going to, you know, it's, it's gonna lock, but it only unlocks one. Why do they want that? Why do they want the driver to be the only one to unlock? Somebody else is sneaking in the vehicle. So some rude yahoo won't get in the other side when you're getting in this side. You got me? <laughs> all right. Uh, check the terminal 1122. I found a nice, healthy ground signal being made available each relay when its respective button was pressed on the key fob. Moving my test lamp alligator clip from the power to the ground, I found there was no power coming through the relay coils to the route module. You got it? So through the relay coils to the route module, I should see power right here. Shouldn't I? No. That should be a constant. I should have power there until they're grounded. Right? So I should see power there. All right. And that's what you, that's one of the things you'll do. If the relay module does flat, see what I was seeing here was I got a good ground right here every time I did something, but there was no power coming to that side of the relay. Because I got a low MP, I got a high impedance test light. Because this is when you use a high impedance test light. If I'm using a regular test light at this point, when I touch this, I'm not going to destroy anything, but I am going to click that relay. You got me? Okay, and so I don't want to click the relay, I just want to see if there's power there with everything in place. So that's what I did. My low impedance lap, unplugged that, found power, I mean, found there was no power there. I'm closing in on the problem. You got me? Basically, you're logically doing it. We're not throwing parts at it. We're just trying to close in on the problem. Here's the relay box. It's about 10 inches above the accelerator panel. It's got a plastic cover. It's got to be removed to access the relays. There are several relays there. Now, our little Ranger doesn't have any of this fantasy keyless entry, so it doesn't have this. It's got the relay in a different spot. Several relays, a full relay center for a ground signal to be delivered from the wrap module. That's basically when I pull the relays and I check for the ground signal with my fob. And when I found one that was flashing a ground signal to one of these relays, I knew which relays it was. You see what I'm saying? I identified the relays that way because the book wasn't really good about that. Okay, pinpointed the location of the lock and unlock relays. I found out which relays were lock and unlock. You needed to know because there were several of them here. Got it? A moment later, I realized there was no power to the hot at all times terminal for each relay. I'm closing in even closer. Right here. Power lock schematic, flip the power door lock schematic, found the height at all times power came through fuse 18. See there? Doom. There you go. That's pretty smooth. Now I could have gone to that earlier, uh, but that's not what I did. And then I go to fuse 18 and I find out there's no fuse there. It's missing. Well, you see all this other garbage that they did, they were following up and all that kind of stuff. At some point, they janked this fuse out. Now, I'm going to pause for just a second, and we don't like much being done in here. But this is a really sweet and to the point. This is the way you find the, find problems. You know what I mean? you got to think clearly, and you got to get your heads into this, and you got to be totally undistracted. And, you know, if you get tired of working on it, you can't go help somebody with tires. you got to, you know what I'm saying? All right, you got to stay on it. you got to stay on it together. There was a, when I was uh, teaching, 
at a government installation. Only time in my whole career I've ever stood behind a podium that had Homeland Security on the front of it and <laughs> they made a presentation. This guy said, um, was telling me in, during a break, I was teaching 25 mechanics of the Border Patrol, and this guy said, the Chevrolet dealership took a vehicle that we had, one of our SUVs that we had put radios and stuff in, and they looked it over to figure out why the ABS light was on. And they worked on it for two solid days. And when they found the problem, it was one of our guys put a radio in, he did something like this. He pulled a fuse and tried to put it back in or whatever. And so they charged us $1,700. So he was going to fuss at his guys for costing him $1,700. Can you see, you see anything wrong with that picture? I see something wrong with the picture. If the guy pulled the fuse out, the mechanic that was working on it, if he was worth his salt in the GM dealership, should have checked the fuse first. He shouldn't have gone all the way around Robin Hood's barn and replaced all those parts. Well, it's not just that. If you pull a fuse, you better replace it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but the guy that if a competent mechanic comes along behind you, he shouldn't charge you seventeen hundred dollars because he didn't check to see if the fuse were there to start with. That's like planting a bug accidentally. So what do you do? What I'm always telling you guys, you do what's cheap and easy first. And y'all, to your credit, you usually do that. The first place you guys go is you check the fuses, and that's smart. You check the dead gum fuses first, you find the easiest connectors to get to, and you check those. And then you go, and you know, you, you easy and cheap first, hard and expensive in steps until you get to where you're going. You got what I'm saying? Anyway, that's what I found right here. The word duh comes to mind. You know, and the funny, the funny thing about that was, I was parking a truck. I found more problems. When I punched the lock button on the fob twice, the locked doors chirped the horn, the park lights flashed without hearing a horn. <laughs> so now we've got this issue going on. So I started getting a little irritated. You know, I thought I was through with this. Have you ever been thinking you were through with something and you're not? Uh, it's kind of like the Hammond belt job. I think I'm through with this. And it runs like crap and you realize you got your marks like this instead of that. Okay. All right. So the horn's unresponsive. I had no junction box diagram either. I remember the relay swapping business that Ryan did whenever we were trying to fuel pump relay. And I was thinking in my mind, these cell phone people have got this thing so fouled up, nobody can fix it. It's kind of like the guy at third base, third base coach, is telling this guy who's playing third base, he says, let me see that glove. I'll show you how to do play third base. And somebody hit him a ground rather, and it bounced off his shin, and he was hopping around saying, you've got third base so fouled up, nobody can play it, you know. <laughs> anyway, that's how I was feeling. Well, anyway, I moved the relay to the right place, and then the horn worked. You know, so basically, yeah, sometimes you have to go back and fix what you screwed up. See, so we screwed something up, too while we were jacking around trying to get through. But it was all well that ends well, but it was humorous how the relay business took me down a notch after I was, you know, setting myself up high and mighty over the people that screwed the other stuff, <laughs> and then we put the relay in the right place. Anyway, that's the end of that story. What did you learn? Anything? Fracking. Huh? Fracking. Who? 